Because uh, love is the greatest transformational power in the universe. Love will transform your home. It'll transform your marriage. It'll transform your church. It'll transform you. I said it to you last week. Love will turn a drunkard into daddy of the year. Love is amazing. Love energizes faith. Paul said, if I have faith that can move mountains, but I have not love, I'm nothing. You understand? We need love in the house of God. Our churches ought to be an oasis of love. That when you walk in, it doesn't matter where you've come from. It doesn't matter what you've been through. It doesn't matter what you've done. You are loved. Hello, my name is Jimmy Miller. Welcome to the Real Life Church Telecast. Today, in just a few seconds, we're going to be bringing you a message about love. Love is such an amazing topic. The love of God poured out in our hearts. And today we want to talk about having the ability to see one another, no longer through eyes of the flesh, but to see one another, including ourselves, as our Father sees us. And I'm telling you straight up, when you begin to see yourself and you begin to see humanity through the eyes of the Father, your faith will absolutely explode. You'll understand for the first time how great His love is and how He will not withhold anything from you. Today could be the start of something brand new in your life, so I encourage you to please listen with an open heart and open ears. Let the love of God flood your home right there where you are. It'll change your world. We love you. We hope to see you really soon right here at Real Life Church. God bless you. Now let's go into the message. You and I need to understand something about love. Love is a central tenet of the Bible. In fact, it's only love that makes the Bible understandable. If you read the Bible and you don't filter it through the concept that God loves you unconditionally, then the, Bi the, the, the very verses that are meant to give life will bring death. Instead of, instead of love and light and life, you'll only read law, rules and rituals. If you read the Bible and you don't understand that it is a letter of love or a book of love, then, you, then, then the Bible, the, the, ver, the verses give birth to Pharisees, Sadducees, religious zealots and tyrants. But if we understand that love is the central tenet of the Bible, it is the theme of the Bible. It's the reason for the Bible. It's the reason for Jesus, for God so loved. Are you all here this morning? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It was love that motivated God to create man in the first place. It was love that motivated God to create a paradise for that man to inhabit. It was love that motivated God to preserve man through the law until such a time that Jesus would come. You understand? The law was never meant to punish, and the law wasn't just about moral and morality and behavior modification. The law was meant to preserve man from the very evil that ruled his heart until such a time that the Savior could come to redeem him. It was love that gave birth to the law. It was love that brought Jesus. It was love that moved Jesus to heal to, say, uh, to, to heal and to deliver and to touch. He, he, he reached out to the lepers. He reached out to the unclean women. He reached out to the, the unrighteous men. He, he recognized no boundaries, no borders. He reached out to all of them. It was love that motivated him. It was love that caused him to weep over Jerusalem when he wanted to receive them and they rejected him and he wanted to preserve them from the very calamity that was coming their way. It was love that made him cry. It was love that made him die. For the scripture says that no man took his life. He laid it down. It was love that caused him to pay the penalty. To, to descend into the nether regions of hell until such a time that the Supreme Court of Heaven cried out enough. And then he rose. It's love that motivates him to this very day to ever make intercession for you and me. It's love, the new commandment that he gave the church had nothing to do with dress code, hairstyle, song style. The, 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 the new commandment that he gave us was that we would love one another 
even as he loved us. Love is the central tenet of the love is the greatest power in the universe. Listen, it, it's hard to preach a sermon about love because it's so exhaustive. It's non ending. It's everywhere. If you have eyes to see it, you can't say enough about it. Love, I've often said this, love is the greatest paradox of all time. Because love makes no sense. Love does everything differently. Listen to some, I wrote these down so I wouldn't miss them. Listen to this. Love makes you immeasurably powerful, yet at the same time makes you astonishingly fragile. You understand that? Love makes you vulnerable to pain, but love also makes you invincible. Love makes you unstoppable, yet love will often stop you in your tracks. It lifts you high, but it drives you low. It gives birth to faith-filled, mountain-moving declarations and to tear-filled moanings. It can fill your day with laughter and your night with crying. It makes you both a leader and a servant. It makes you appear to be a victim, but it forms you into a champion. We're talking about the paradox of love. It releases, listen to this, it releases you of your burdens, but it places upon you the burdens of the weak. I had, when I wrote that, I had to stop and say, oh my word. It relieves you of your burdens, but it places upon you the burdens of others. It makes you sing songs of victory, but it makes you cry out in intercession. It makes you invulnerable to personal pain, but you'll feel the pain of everyone around you. We're talking about love. Love is perplexing. Rewarding, frustrating, and maybe the single greatest treasure of heaven. Go to the book of John, chapter 13, and we'll get started here. I won't keep you long. I probably won't finish, though, either. So we'll have to pick it up next week. John, chapter 13, begin reading in verse 34. While you're turning there, let me say to you that love is the only real Christian identifier. You see, a lot of people think they're identified as Christians by what they don't do. If you think that what you don't do is what identifies you as a Christian, then you have at least, if you're not a legalist, you have been influenced by legalism. Because the thing that identifies you is not the name on the sign of the church you attend. The greatest identifier of Christianity is love. For the scripture says this, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you. That you also love one another. By this will all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. When we read this and understand it, then the sad realization is this. Not everyone who's in church is in Christ. Because someone who attends the church and makes it their motive to squash the dreams of those around them, to stab people in the back and be rude and ill-mannered and mean. Listen, that doesn't make you a prophet. Some people think, you just, you just, if I'm mean, I'm a prophet. No, you just mean. Because even the gift of prophecy is supposed to be motivated and empowered by love. I remember one old preacher, I think it was George, George Wesley, that said, don't ever preach about hell without tears in your eyes. Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. If we can bring that into our modern day, this is what it would say. Neither Baptist nor Pentecostal means anything. Neither Lutheran or charismatic means anything. Neither black nor white, male nor female, poor nor rich means anything. 
But there's one thing that means everything. But faith working through love. Everyone say love. love. Now, I'm going to tell you that as I'm preaching this today, Brother Hagin used to tell us that what you preach on is what will manifest. So I'm going to preach. I'm going to keep preaching on love until love breaks out. Because uh, love is the greatest transformational power in the universe. Love will transform your home. It'll transform your marriage. It'll transform your church. It'll transform you. I said it to you last week. Love will turn a drunkard into daddy of the year. Love will make love will make the soil bloom flowers or grow flowers that bloom, whatever works. Love is amazing. Love energizes faith. This word here, faith working by love, means that faith, the Greek is energio. It's the word where we get the word energy. And it literally means your faith is energized, becomes operational, or really even effective by love. This is why, and I won't quote it, but you'll know there's a verse where Paul said, if I have faith that can move mountains... But I have not love, I'm nothing. You understand? We need love in the house of God. Our churches ought to be an oasis of love. That when you walk in, it doesn't matter where you've come from, it doesn't matter what you've been through, it doesn't matter what you've done, you are loved. Because the men and the women of God who call themselves by Christ's name have been so bathed in love that we don't judge you based upon anything other. We listen, the Bible says we're not even supposed to see each other through natural eyes. And we'll get to that in a few moments, God willing. When you begin to see people the way the Father sees them, it will blow your mind, rock your world, and render you down to nothing. I mean, you and I got to be prepared, man, if we really want to be like Paul. You know, you know that Paul was a love slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. If we want to be love slaves, we got to be willing to pay an amazing, amazing price. But it's well worth it. It's a great deal. I like deals. Don't you like deal? Like that, that steak? That's a deal. I also I like going. I like I like electronic deals. I like book deals. When you walk in and they got, they got the book down to five cents. I buy it even if I'll never read it. I like deals. Exchanging everything I am for everything he is, is the greatest deal of all time. Because all I've got to do is die to self. All I've got to do is increase that he might, or all I've got to do is decrease that he might increase. That's a deal. Amen. Listen to this. This the the way to un, increase our faith is not through more willpower. The ra, the way to increase our faith is through greater intensity of love. The greater the intensity of my love toward God, the greater of my the impact of my faith inward. Let me explain this. The greater my the intensity of my love Godward the greater the impact of my faith inwardly, meaning more joy, more peace, more light, more love. The things of the spirit only increase with the using. The things of the flesh decrease as you use them. Your body decreases as you use it. But your spirit grows stronger day by day. So the greater the intensity of my love Godward, the greater the impact of my faith. And it's also the same concerning you, the brethren, the people of God. The greater my love, the intensity of my love towards you, the greater the impact of my faith in your life. You see, because if I have no love for you, I'm never going to be moved by faith to do anything for you. This is the reason why. Is this okay this morning? I know I'm not supposed to say that, but I'm not hearing any amens. Maybe I ought to switch that. Brother Hagin used to say, I'm preaching better than you're amening. If we're never moved 
by love to become an agent of change or a helper in anyone else's life, then we have no faith. Or as James said, our faith is dead. But if I am moved by love, maybe I can't meet your whole need, but I can do something to lighten your load. If I do nothing but pull up alongside you, put my arms around you and say, I'm with you until this ends. I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to walk with you. If I have what you need, I'm going to give it to you. But I'm going to do something to be a part of your life, even in your moment of pain. Then if I love you that much, then my faith is going to be a greater impact in your life. This is the reason why Jesus said, this is how all men are going to know you're my disciples. Why? Because through love, we're actively involved in each other's lives. Amen. But pastor, you don't understand if, if I love them, they're going to abuse me. Yes. If I love them, they're going to misuse me. Yes. But if you don't love them, then where's your faith? Thank you. This is the gospel. This is what, listen, this is what separates the gospel of Jesus Christ from just a motivational speech. A motivational speech, speech just makes you feel that you are okay right where you are and calls for no change. The gospel of Jesus Christ says you've got to change. That's right. right. You've got to love more, give more, sacrifice more. But haven't I given enough? No. Not until we give to the level he gave because he said you're supposed to love even as I loved. Yeah. We can't have great faith without having great love. Love removes the barriers to faith. Listen to this. As I become more aware of this great love with which I'm loved, and in the book of Ephesians, it, it, you, don't have to, you don't have to turn there now, but Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4, says that we are loved with a great love. And in 1 John chapter 3, John said the only reason we can even call ourselves sons and daughters of God is because of the great love with which he loved us. John wrote, he said, we've come to know and believe the love that God has for us. He, he said just preceding that, that the knowledge of, and I'm paraphrasing a bit, the knowledge of this perfect love, it cast out all fear. Because see, when you understand the great love with which God loves you, it erases all the barriers to faith. Because never again will you doubt God will. You see, if you don't know that God loves you and you think that what motivates God to bless you is because you deserve it, you prayed enough, you gave enough, you sacrificed enough, how can you ever define enough? You can never define enough. You never know when you've done enough. So we've got to quit trying to deserve and begin just to receive. You see, I may not deserve it, but I can still receive it because I'm loved. So love removes all the barriers to faith because no longer do I ask, why would God? And then look for a reason in my life that somehow would force or manipulate God to do something he really doesn't want to do. Now the question is, why wouldn't God? You understand? That's an amazing difference. I can stand in the midst of my pain and say, why wouldn't he heal me? If he loved me so much that he gave Jesus Christ to die on a cross when I didn't even have him in my mind, now that I'm a child of his, why wouldn't he heal me? I'm no, and when the devil comes to condemn me and bring me guilt and shame and tell me how unworthy I am, I just simply def I diffuse his argument by agreeing and saying, you're right, I don't deserve it. But that's why there's a wonderful thing called mercy. And I receive it by grace, which I don't deserve. <laughs> but I receive because he loves me. And because he loves me, he'll meet my needs. Because he loves me, he'll deliver me. Because he loves me, he'll bring light. Because he loves me, he'll bring life. 
Because he loves me, he'll be my very present help. And it's, are you getting anything out of this? Because he loves me, he will not depart from me when I stumble. He picks me up. Because he loves me when I've sinned and I'm at the pigs in the pen and I'm feeding them and I'm living so far below who I really am. He doesn't judge me. He runs to me and he moves the slop out of the way and he kisses me on the cheek. Yes. See, this is the right. Some people think God is just a judge. They think God is out just to do nothing more than to kill and destroy and tear down. They don't know the father. The father loves. Well, then why all the discipline? Why? Because whom he loves. He disciplines. Why does he discipline? The same reason you discipline your children, not because you're seeking to punish them for being, you just want them to be more than who they become. Right. As we understand love, fear fades away. Go to the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 32. We already quoted it, but we're going to read it. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? The, the religious would decry that that's not true. You got to deserve it. How can you deserve it when the Bible says your best is as filthy rags? Hmm? You know, you can receive so much more through mercy than you can through works. I depend upon the love of God, not my own worthiness. Love liberates. I want to say this to you. Love is the greatest liberating power in history. The love of God revealed through Christ liberated the captives. Note, this didn't make everyone happy. Listen to this. The love of Christ liberated some, infuriated others. And it's still the same today. Why do you think when the faith, when, well, when healing first broke out, there were those who stood in opposition to healing. Then when the faith message began to sweep the land, there were those who stood against faith. And then when grace began to sweep through as a revelation of the land, there were those who withstood grace. This is why you got to understand why the love of God doesn't please everyone, because there are some people that have learned to play the game and they make their livelihood and they find their identity out of keeping the captives captive. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And this works. Listen, this works in the religious world, the political world, the social world. There are some they don't want the system to change because they have learned to, to to gain from the master slave economic system. And what love does, love comes and it upsets the whole thing because it makes the master the slave and it makes the slave the master. You've got to understand, remember when the woman followed Paul around and began to cry out, listen to these men, they are men of God, they are preaching the way of salvation. And after a few days, the Bible says that Paul had finally found it intolerable. <laughs> So he rebuked her and cast out the devil. Do you know not everyone rejoiced? She got happy because she was a captive, held bound, and love set her free. But those who made their money from her demonic ways and from her witchcraft, they weren't happy because it just cost them their livelihood. There are people that have made, whether they be preachers or politicians, they have made their livelihood based upon keeping the people of God captive. And when love comes in and it sets you free and you're no longer bound to their rules, you no longer have to live according to their regulations. And never again will you allow limited men who have limited God to limit you. Amen. It doesn't make them all happy. So you've got to understand that as you become a recipient of love and an agent of love, not everyone's going to celebrate you. But I'm going to say it again, and I'm not the one who originated it. If we value the applause of men greater than the applause of God, then the applause of men will cost us the applause of God. Love is the greatest way. We've got to risk being free. There may be greater security, supposedly, 
in rules and regulations and dress code and moral. But there's great that, that, that security is a fallacy. It's actually a deception. Because only in love can you ever truly become who God created you to be. Love is the greatest liberator in history. Hmm. Love is the power of Christianity. Listen to this. I want to say this again. Love is the power of Christianity and affords us our best opportunity to be like Jesus. John chapter 13, verse 34. We already read it, so I'm going to say it again real quick. A new commandment he gave us that we love one another. Romans chapter 5, verse 5. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts. You know, listen to this. If God, if Jesus gave us the commandment to love even as he loved, it would be a point of frustration for him to say, you need to love each other as I've loved you and not give us the ability to love one another that way. So he had to pour out his love within our hearts by the spirit of God so that we could love one another. I want to say this to you and I'm trying to hurry up. But the, the, all of us have the potential to be just like Jesus. All of us have the potential to love one another even as he's loved. But many, if, if, if we all have the potential to love to that capacity and we all have the potential to live unlimited love lives, unlimited faith lives and unlimited lives in general, then how come we don't experience more and, and portray more the love of God? Because there's a thing called cost, and I want to get to that real quick. Cost is the great disqualifier of life. You can have anything in life you're willing to pay the cost for. But if you're unwilling to pay the cost, you can't have it. Not because you couldn't get it, but you can't get it because you disqualified yourself because you're not willing to pay the cost. That's true in spiritual things and physical things. When Deborah and I used to fly across the ocean, sometimes 20 times a year, I always wanted to be first class, but sometimes I was sat back by the toilets in a seat that wouldn't even recline, smelling the blue water. Why? Because I wanted to be seated by the toilets? No, I was just unwilling to pay the price for first class. But if I'd been willing to pay the price, I could have been seated in first class. You understand that? If you're willing to pay the cost, you can be the spiritual giant you've always prayed you would be. If you're willing to pay the cost, you can be the agent of change in a dark world that you desire to be. So you just, well, if I just pray about it enough, you've been praying about it for 20 years. Now you just got to be willing to pay the cost. Well, I thought Jesus paid it all. He paid it all so that you could obtain it, but you've got to pay it to get it. Thank you for watching today. For donation of any amount, we would like to offer you an audio CD of today's message in its entirety. Just contact us here at Real Life Church using the information that is on your screen. Again, for a donation of any amount, you can receive an audio CD of today's message. We know that you will be blessed. Be sure to get this month's special offer. For a donation of any amount, Pastor Mello would like you to receive his book, The ABCs of Dream Development. It has touched many lives, and I know that it will bless you. We would like to invite you to come and worship with us this Sunday at Real Life Church. Worship begins at 10.30 a.m. Come and see how God is moving and be a part of something special. We hope to see you there.